Calvo's Insurance, serving Guam for 80 years. Matson and the Adahi Tanu Program. Cars Plus, visit today during our spring sales event. IP&E, fueling excellence. McDonald's of Guam, I'm loving it. And King's Restaurant, located in Tamuning and Dededo. Always open, always local. Ahead on primetime, the former lieutenant governor makes a public appearance a week before he goes to trial for his gun-grabbing case. Plus, emotional testimony given before senators during a Guam Congress hearing on war claims still unpaid. And the transfer of power could be back with Gov Guam soon, the latest, and a look at the landfill in Lazon as the governor and chief judge goes on tour. Celebrity Rensen Samoro Ginin KUAM Hafade Guahusinik Delgado. Well, the former second in command of the territory, all set to go to trial for last summer's gun grabbing incident in Tumon. Former Lieutenant Governor Ray Tenorio appearing in local court for his case today. His defense attorney arguing that Tenorio did nothing wrong. Here's a look at what happened. Walking alongside his wife and his attorney, former Lieutenant Governor Ray Tenorio walks into the Superior Court's Northern Satellite in Dededo Wednesday morning. We're looking forward to the trial because we want to move on to the next chapter of our lives and um, move past this um, a very challenging and anxiety-filled um, chapter of my life. This is the first public appearance Tenorio has made since leaving office. We're looking forward to the next chapter of our lives. Tenorio faces misdemeanor charges of official misconduct and reckless conduct. He stands accused of grabbing a police officer gun multiple times during last year's barbecue block party in Tumon. He called it a teaching moment for the officer and has since apologized for the incident. Chief Prosecutor Basil O'Malley and Defense Attorney Tom Fisher say they are ready to begin trial next week. I wouldn't go more than two days. This is not an easy thing for anyone, including myself. Uh, I know it's, uh, at least for me, uh, it is um, something that has been uh, weighing on me uh, because I want to clear my name and I want to show the people as I have uh, my attorney. Uh, I respect every police officer and everybody who has a duty in this process. Uh, it's interesting to be on this side of the um, equation in the criminal justice system, but I've been a part of criminal justice my whole life and I believe in the uh, sanctity of the process and I hope that Every person brings a true account of what happened so we can finally be done with this. Tenorio is also waiting for certain documents. GPD's firearm and holstering policy requested for his defense that the force has yet to release. I'm sure they're going to be needed and I'm sure they're going to be necessary. Uh, we're going to just try and work around it and hopefully they'll be divulged uh, before the trial. We've never understood why they're trying to, um, why GPD is standing in the way of releasing those clearly releasable documents. Since leaving office and awaiting trial, Tenorio says he's been taking care of priorities at the home front. It's stuff that need to be done, you know, when you're, when you're elected official, as uh, Lou and Josh now are in the helm of the government, you know, the, the needs of the people take first priority over all other considerations. Uh, our faith in God, our faith in the justice system, our faith in our government to be able to do the things, to look out for the interests of the people are always going to be uh, our highest priority. Multiple witnesses could be called following jury selection next week, including former Governor Eddie Calvo and former Chief of Police G.I. Cruz. It's clear that the Lieutenant Governor had the authority to do what it is that he did do, and we're going to establish that. We've never understood why we're at trial on this case. The reason we don't understand it is because no crime took place. Jury selection and trial begins on March 13th. And while many of you watched on Facebook as we live streamed Tenorio's appearance before the judge this morning, a bunch of you had some very strong opinions, both against and in favor of the former number two man in the island's public sector. So to see what you had to say, let's bring in Ken St. Nicholas from the Digital Desk with tonight's Your Take. Hafidei, many of you caught our Facebook live stream this morning featuring the former Lieutenant Governor Ray Tenorio in his uh, pre-hearing for his trial regarding the gun grab incident from the barbecue block party. Many people echoing the sentiment that they feel the former Lieutenant Governor is guilty. Rudy Menno saying, you commit the crime, so spend the time. We are not haters, I'm just being real, and since when is his title as Lieutenant Governor give him a right to such a crime. Many of you on Facebook echoed that same sentiment, but many came to the former Lieutenant Governor's defense, uh, including Terry Salas, who said, damn haters, and Tanya Chamarita Wilson, who said he wasn't gonna hurt anyone, sheesh. So there you go, split. Um, 
people on both sides of the topic here, both sides of the issue here, which side do you fall on? Do you feel the former lieutenant governor should be punished for his actions or did he legally have the authority to do such a thing? Well, the Civil Service Commission has rejected a bid by former police Colonel Mark Charfris to avoid his adverse action. Charfris argued that the CSC failed to comply with time standards, but commissioners voted 6-0 to zero to deny the petition. Charfris was fired from GPD for insubordination and conduct unbecoming after a December 2016 incident in his home village of Agate. He was videotaped shouting vulgarities at police officers who were responding to a report of illegal fireworks. A hearing on his case is scheduled for later this month. Well, for some of those survivors still living, the war really never ended. A hearing for resolution supporting the combined war claims efforts of Guam held at the Guam Congress Hall today. Chris Barnett has more. Senator Amanda Shelton's Resolution 36 lending support for the congressional, executive and administrative efforts to get Guam war claims checks paid. Senator Shelton saying by sending the resolution to Congress and federal level stakeholders, Guam is expressing a unified desire to seek justice. While the resolution supports the current war claims law and effort, emotional testimony from Jose Garrido focused on World War II survivors who died before the December 2016 cutoff for war claims. Maybe silence is my testimony. I thought I would be able to. to say my story. Garrido telling the panel of senators his family members who suffered atrocities during the Japanese occupation of Guam died before the December 2016 cutoff to apply for war claims. This legislature and this government and Guam should just find some other solution to include those that have passed away and were disqualified based on this settlement. I fully support this uh, resolution and uh, hopefully like I've been I'm repeating that those that that we are going to forget will actually not be forgotten and find some other law that this uh, that this legislature can pass. Senator Shelton said she would take suggestions Garrido made in his testimony into consideration. For Guam's News Network, Chris Barnett reports. Well, it was touch and go trip for Guam's delegate Michael St. Nicholas. According to his Facebook post, con the congressman landed on Guam Sunday and left the island yesterday. No word if the delegate met with any constituents during his short stay on the island. Now, as reported, the St. Nicholas has had some trouble getting his local district office open. A tentative March 1st opening for the office was pushed back after his uh, location locally suffered water damage from Typhoon Wutip. St. Nicholas's office is now slated to open on March 18th. The delegate left island yesterday without holding a town hall meeting or press conference. Numerous emails sent to him and his legal counsel for clarification and comment went unanswered. After more than a decade under federal receivership, it appears a solid waste system will finally be returned to local control. The district court held site visits Wednesday to brief the governor, senators and other stakeholders on the upcoming transition. Nessa Lacanto reports. The tour began at the Lazon Landfill, where District Court Chief Judge Francis Tadinko Gatewood scheduled a hearing so Federal Receiver Representative Chase Anderson could brief the group on the progress of the solid waste system, or what he calls containing the beast. It all began when the federal EPA cited Gov Guam after toxic chemicals from the old Orda dump were found to be leaking into the nearby Lonfit River. After years of inaction, Judge Gatewood in 2008 appointed the receiver to oversee the closure of ORDOT and the opening of the new landfill. Eleven years and tens of millions of dollars in expenditures later, the judge says they're ready to give it back. When I hand over the receivership, I'm going to put out how many companies. There have been so many local companies on Guam, including Brown and Caldwell, Black Construction and others, who have contributed to the success of the closure of the ORDOT dump and the opening of the landfill, and uh, I think uh, Chase had mentioned just a few. Trash collection has improved, the ORDOT dump has been capped, the toxic leachate is under control, and a new landfill is open. But when the Guam Solid Waste Authority does take over, it will have to open a new cell. 
The existing ones are projected to reach capacity by 2020, and Governor Leon Guerrero says she knows they need to find the money soon. I would have to look at what the current financial plans are, financing plans are, and uh, look at what other options there are. There could be federal grants, there could be work with the USDA, you know, not necessarily just going out on the bond market or borrowing. Yeah. So I'm very aware of that need. The hearing continues on Thursday, but in the more comfortable confines of the Federal District Court building. For Guam's News Network, I'm Nestor Lacanto. Thanks, Ness. Well, senators listened and questioned what these new faces would bring to the Guam Memorial Hospital. Glynis Almonte, a registered nurse, and Byron Evaristo, senior VP at Bank of Pacific, accepted their nominations to the GMH board during the hearing. Senators questioned how they will use their expertise to address seven areas of deficiencies cited by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I have not really read the seven citations, but I went through uh, some of the readings, information about Medicare um, survey results, and I think most of them are within the management areas. So what I would do is read and be, get more familiar with those citations. I'd like to work with Lillian, kind of hear from her, uh, what plans that they have in place. If there are any, if, are there any timelines uh, to carry out those plans and determine how far along we are? The board not meeting regularly was also a major area of concern cited by CMS and the Joint Commission Accreditation Team. The pairs say with financial issues facing Guam's only public hospital, the board should meet monthly rather than quarterly. No word yet when the board will meet next. Military meetings are set were set back due to Typhoon Wutip. They have now been scheduled. The U.S. Navy is inviting the public to open house meetings for the Mariana Islands Training and Testing Draft Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement and Overseas Environmental Impact Statement. The public comment period has also been extended by 15 days from March 18th to April 2nd. The Navy is hosting separate meetings on Guam and in the CNMI. The meeting on Guam will be held at UOG's School of Business and Public Administration, Room 129, from 5 to 8 p.m. We have a complete list of other meetings, including up in the CNMI, and how you can comment up right now on our website. Well, stick around for more news here on Primetime. You're watching KUAM. There are more ways to experience Guam via KUAM News, giving you what you want, when you want, and how you want it. From smart devices, Alexa, what's in the news? Here's your flash briefing. Over the web, on mobile, on streaming platforms, with immersive, interactive formats, and via social media where it's more than just content, it's conversation. More ways to keep you informed and entertained whenever you want it, wherever you are, on whatever device you're using. A simple handshake. That's all Jake Calvo needed when he started his company. Today, 80 years later, we like to say thank you to all of you who have taken our hand in trust. Thank you to the dreamers. Thank you to the realists. Thank you to the family oriented. Thank you to the entrepreneurial. Thank you to those climbing the corporate ladder and to the ones starting a new life together. Thank you to the traditionalists and the edgy to the young at heart and the old souls. Thank you to the daring, to the protective, to the practical. Thank you to the hopeful, to all of you from all of us, our deepest, happiest, and infinite thanks. 80 years here for you. 80 years thanks to you. Calvo's Insurance, a legacy of trust. Looking for a great deal on a new Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, or Ram? Then get to Cars Plus and Mighty now for our spring sales event. Like a new Jeep Compass Sport, $166 per paycheck. Or a new Chrysler Pacifica LX, $220 per paycheck. Or save $8,500 on a new Ram 1500. How about a new Jeep Wrangler Sport, only $274 per paycheck. Low 1.99% financing is available on approved credit. Save thousands during our spring sales event going on now at Cars Plus in Mighty. Cars Plus, driven by you. You can make each connection count with IT&E Prepaid. Talk, text, and share with the best price daily plans and rates. Stay in touch with loved ones, whether they're in Tumon, Garapan, San Jose, or even San Apollo, on the widest network in the Marianas. And reach out to friends and followers all over the world with the fastest, most reliable 4G LTE data. IT&E, explore your world.
Welcome back. Well, this video might have come across one of your group chats. The video shows a woman apparently throwing cardboard boxes into the ocean in Samuni. A couple of workers with Joe's jet, jet Ski, Kobe Guzman and Jaya Rebinal saw what was happening, tried to get her to stop. I started recording, asked her, what are you doing? You know, there's a trash can right there. And eventually she said, this is, this is not trash. So we actually took the time off just to go out there and take those boxes and throw it back in the bin. It didn't look like she was in the right state of mind. I, I, you know, I'm not a doctor to say what she was or what, but the way she was talking to us, she started cussing at us a little bit because I was getting a little angry at her about throwing trash. And she finally packed up and left as she was going away. We went over there and started picking it up out of the water to show her that this is how it's supposed to be done. What? The woman hasn't returned since. Remember, it is illegal to litter. For now, the message from Kobe and JR, keep our beaches clean, especially for our visitors. AG Levin Camacho is urging the U.S. Senate to enact the Telephone Robocall Abuse Criminal Enforcement and Deterrence Act. It proposes to curb illegal robocalls and spoofing. A coalition of 54 attorneys general sent a letter to the U.S. Senate Committee of Commerce, Science and Transportation supporting the TRACE Act. The legislation will require voice service providers to participate in a call authenticate authentication framework to help block unwanted calls and creates an interagency working group to take additional calls to reduce robocalls and hold telemarketers and robocallers accountable. Camacho, who is in Washington, D.C., states, quote, robocalls are not only frustrating, but they can also be illegal. The widespread support that the act has received from attorneys general from across the country highlights the commitment that our offices have made to protect consumers and harassment and scams. The chair of Federal Affairs announced progress on her pledge to pursue new economic opportunities for Guam. The issue, Guam's growing role as an international telecommunications hub in the Asia-Pacific region in support of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. During her recent trip to the nation's capital, Senator Regine Bisco Lee met with federal partners in the Office of Digital Services Industries of the U.S. Department of Commerce regarding the development of the Japan-Guam-Australia fiber optics submarine cable system project. It was announced in April of 2018. On the advice of federal experts, Senator Lee is transmitting a prelim brief of the undersea cables for Guam. The senator believes there is potential technical and financial support for a study of future Guam undersea cable projects and the ways she says we can capture the accompanying benefits to our economy. Ultimately, Lee says this will create new opportunities for digital connectivity throughout the region. A $75,000 grant was awarded to the Guam Energy Office. The grant is to be used for the Energy Smart Schools program. With GPA, they're conducting in-depth energy audits at various schools. The current two-year award will focus on private schools as GPA completes the audits of 39 GDOE schools. The grant also covers an Energy Smart Conference and training activities. Now to regional headlines, here's KSPN 2 News. Half a day Guam, here are the top headlines for CNMI. It's a project that has been in the works for the last 31 years. It's the street naming and home numbering system. The uh, on February 11, 1988, uh, provided for the establishment of Saipan Street Directory Commission. Uh, the commission initial members were Saipan Mayor, uh, Director of Public Works, Director of Public Safety, a letter chair of the Board of Public Land was added to Saipan Law 11-3, local law 11-3. The commission was charged with the responsibility of developing a Saipan street name and numbering map. Currently, no houses or businesses are identified by numbers due to the P.O. box. But soon, every building on the island of Saipan will have a number, opening up opportunity for emergency services and postal. So this uh, project will benefit uh, a lot of uh, people in the community. Uh, the 911 system, uh, ambulance, uh, emergency, and uh, fire, you know. Uh, so as the post office, they decide to do uh, home delivery service. A contract for the project has been awarded to Henry Pengelinen and Associates, LLC, and will cost around $64,000. As the local delegation that passed bills to change, change existing street names to different names, and that was like um, it happened so many years ago. 
the actual street names were changed, mm -hmm. but the master map does not reflect the, the changes. And that's the current phase of the project, where Pengalinen and his workers will map all the locations of property and buildings. Then the numbers will be placed on each house and building, which is projected to take six to seven months. So with the street numbering, no, uh, no individual person may select their own number. It has to be based on the grid. Yeah. So uh, for street names, those streets that haven't been named, but the families live in that area and they want to put that on the map, have them call us, or they can call us, or their uh, congressmen in their yeah. precincts. The first phase is developing the master map, then converting to the electronic version and to GPS. So uh, the center point would be somewhere off-site in the ocean, right, Mr. Yeah. Pengelin? And that's going to throw points to yeah. streets, and then yeah. the numbering would start from that point. Yeah. Let's say uh, from the point to Cobrerville High School, that's uh, 2.7 miles. So yeah. the numbering would start at 2,700, yeah. yeah. something like that. Yeah. The mayor's office is asking the cooperation of the public during the process of mapping out and numbering of each building. What's going to happen is uh, the firm would send out their staff to do ground truthing, yeah. ground truth. Yeah. So uh, we want to emphasize to the public that when you see Mr. Pengelinen's car out there or staff, yeah. mm -hmm. please cooperate with them. Yeah. They're not there to spy or do something, but they're there to do this with them. Each employee will be wearing a badge as identification at each house and building during the Saipan Street Numbering and Addressing Project. Reporting for KSPN, I'm Ashley McDowell. For more news, visit SaipanTV.com. For KSPN 2, I'm Ashley McDowell. It's Ash Wednesday, the start of the Lenten season for the island's Catholics. Christians observe the period leading up to Easter by sacrificing and fasting. The faithful flock to masses such as this one at the Santa Barbara Church in Dededo to begin their solemn reflection. The mass includes the placing of ashes on the foreheads to symbolize repentance. The sacrifice that the Lord went through for us, that the least we can do is repay him by serving you know our lord in in church and our prayers every day sacrificing yourself for all the wrong things you have done in the world and uh, repentance of course is a must and uh, like father said uh, abstinence for everything food and whatever giving up things that you've you've done in the past and try to make a make yourself a better person that is um repenting for our sins yeah it's uh, like you know a renewal for our um, Christian life. The Lenten season comprises the 46 days before Easter Sunday, which this year falls on April 21st. Well, sports is coming up next, but first, here's a look at your island weather. that an alpha insurance customer needs a claim settled immediately i'm on it in the event of an accident theft or breakdown each of our alpha insurer agents are trained to go above and beyond this is my stop there she is target acquired
KUAM Sports is presented by Triple J. Dave Delgado here for KUAM Sports. Thanks for watching. In studio, Kyle Money Uggin. We're talking mixed martial arts. You're getting ready for your upcoming fight, Pancrase 304 in Japan. Uh, let's talk about training camp. Man, training camp's been great. I actually started really early on this one. I usually st stop all the, uh, the, the junk food and all the messing around, maybe six weeks out, but I kind of cut it. I started at 12 weeks out. Um, I'll be fighting the uh, number one contender out of Pancrase. It's me and him, and then after that will be a title fight. But um, for training camp, man, I've been concentrating on a lot of wrestling. I have this uh, world champ coming in. Her name's Miyu Yamamoto. She's here and three-time world champ, and I've just been working on a lot of wrestling. Almost every other day I'm wrestling, just trying to make it better. Um, but yeah, overall, CrossFit. I've been doing my strength and conditioning over at CrossFit Laddystone. I've been doing it there. And then for Spike, our whole MMA mixed martial arts, we kind of have our old gym at back but then we're also doing stuff at custom fitness as well so we get a little training in over at custom fitness then we're over at the house and then working my boxing and actually i just we brought in this uh not brought in but there's an old school boxer his name's uh errol allegri yeah so he's been coming to the house uh spike 22 and just been cleaning up my boxing man so like my wrestling my boxing is just getting uh, into another different level you know so my game's just stepping up that that much more like i've been in this game since like 07 and I'm still learning you know I always thought I was a wrestler until I met Miu I always thought I knew how to box until I met um, Errol so everything's just getting a lot better and more crispier have you noticed uh, when you fight against these Japanese guys mm -hmm. that a lot of them really resort to their grappling not not necessarily too much uh, ground with jiu-jitsu but more yeah. of the grappling side yeah that's that's very true a lot every time I fight a Japanese guy all I know is that I'm going into a going into a fight that's going to have a lot of scrambles in it so i always prep for that i do a lot of jujitsu a lot of wrestling just so i can i would like to think that my wrestling is my strong point so i would like to out scramble them every time so try and be prepared before i fight a japanese just because i know that they have good grappling as well and what do you know about your opponent as far as size yeah so size he's he, we're about the same size uh he's a tall lengthy guy he's probably like five nine maybe the same height as me he's a striker though Actually, no, he's, he's more of a striker, but he's, a, he's not great everywhere, but he's a good striker, good wrestler, good grappler. So his whole MRA, MMA game is a good game, but I don't think he has, like, superior striking or superior wrestling. He's just his, he has a good basic MMA game. So he's Ellen, a tough guy. Right now you're walking around. Wait, what, what are you weighing right now? Mm, right now, uh, I usually don't stay far out. So now that I fight, I move from 135 to 145. So I'm walking around maybe between 158 to 162. So I fluctuate from there, then down to 155. So never, never that far off. So like 10 pounds, 11 pounds out. And uh, how can people follow you on your journey? Uh, Instagram or? Yeah, you can check me on Instagram. I usually post, I'm actively posting about training, about what I'm eating, about what I'm drinking, always having coffee. Um, but yeah, but that's what keeps going. And just Kyle again? Kyle again. Uh, it's actually Kyle Uggen 135. You got uh, to move it. You got to change it to 145. Yeah, it's going to update it. All right. It. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for uh, checking us out. That's going to do it for sports. We're back right after this.